the book of Jude, um, we read from verse 5. Uh, we having completed verse 1 to verse 4 last Sunday evening. We will read from verse 5 uh, to um, verse uh, 16. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Jude, uh, sorry, um, now, I dis now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe, and angels who did not keep their domain, but abandoned their proper abode. He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. And since they remain in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as examples, as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the, uh, when he disputed uh, with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce um, against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. These men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like reasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain and, pay they, uh, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts. When they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, deadly, a, a double dead, a doubly dead, uprooted wild waves of the sea, casting up the, the, their own shame like foam, um, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied saying, behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly for all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way and of all harsh things which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. For the Lord's Day evening service, this is God's inerrant, infallible, immutable, inspired and holy word. And all who heard it said, Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday evening, I began the book of Jude, and we finished at verse 4. The exposition of the text, making it uh, clear that Jude, if you remember from last week, Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, Jude, uh, by his Hebrew name, would be Judah. By his Greek name, would be Judas. And so the book is, should be called, if it's in Greek, should be called the book of Judas. In Hebrew, it should be called the book of Judah. In English, it's called the book of Jude. And Jude being the half-brother of Jesus, meaning that Joseph and Mary had sexual relationship after Jesus, and therefore these children like James and Jude are the result of that relationship. They are the half-brother. And I spent time last week telling you how Jude came to salvation after the resurrection and ascension of his brother Jesus Christ. He did not believe Jesus to be the Messiah or uh, the savior of his soul, uh, though growing up in the same household, though uh, growing up with Jesus as his older brother, um, did not regard him in that way. But once Jesus is uh, resurrected and ascended to heaven, his half-brother Jude comes to salvation, comes to trust Jesus, for uh, the saving of his soul. And, and Jude now writes to the church. And I won't go back and cover what I covered last week because I want to progress. As I sat there tonight, I thought to myself, let me change the sermon a little bit. I want to take you more to an expository sermon tonight. We have a lot of people here tonight. I actually said tonight, I actually said, when I was sitting there, I said, um, 
when, when, when we started to pray, I said, there, there are people in the church who I know here tonight, so I'm going to teach. As I got up to stand here, I see two people that I don't know tonight sitting here. And so uh, I, I will teach and preach tonight. And so let me teach you the text tonight. Let me teach you the text tonight. So in teaching the text tonight, we recognize that Jude is making clear that there is going to be warfare, not outside the church, but warfare within the church. I made very clear last week that the bulk of the New Testament writing addresses the attack not from the outside, but the attack from the inside. The bulk of the New Testament writing through Peter, through Paul, through Jude here tonight, even through James, addresses matters within the church. That means the church was planted, the church grew, the church flourished, the church uh, uh, was blessed with God's word. But through time, even as Paul says to the Ephesian elders, after I leave, um, wolves will come, savage wolves, and they will try to destroy the work. And that's exactly what happened. After he left, after the church was founded uh, in these various places, the attack began from within the church. So a lot of people are trying to blame uh, the outside forces. And, and true, there's no doubt, the outside forces have a great deal to do with trying to destroy the church. But what we see in Jude, what you saw in uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians this morning, what we see in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, what we see in the book of Ephesians, what we see in James, what we see Paul reminding us of, is the problem is in the church. It's people from within the church. And, and Jude makes this clear in verse 4. In verse 4 he says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Listen to what he says. Certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. These are men within the church. These are men sitting in the pews. These are men sitting amongst us in the congregation, singing the same song, saying amen to the prayers. But these are men that are at, at, the, at the back of their mind have the idea that they're going to deny the Lord, as, as, as Jude tells us at the end of verse 4, they deny our, our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So they come in unnoticed. And we've been praying as a church, isn't it? We've been praying for the Lord to keep us as a small congregation, to keep us pure, and to keep us right before Him. That indeed, we, when this comes in, uh, when people come into the church or when people join the church, uh, that they, we will recognize that they're not bringing in these worldly philosophies and worldly ide ideologies and haven't infiltrated the church and joined the church to destroy it with their ungodly ways. And I'm going to show you those ungodly ways by looking in verse 8, when it says in verse 8, yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming... I'm going to show you that the word dreaming there, what it really means. It's not based on God's word. These men within the church are dreamers. They have these philosophies and ideas. And these philosophies and ideas are not based on God's word. They're just ideas of men. But let's not run ahead of ourselves. We recognize, beginning from verse 1, what does Jude say in verse 3? He says, In verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt, in, I felt it necessary to write to you, appealing to you, that you contend earnestly for the faith. The faith there is not the faith saving faith. It is the faith which is the body of our Christianity. All of the message of the gospel, the full counsel of God, both doctrine and practice. Jude says, I want you to contend for the entirety of our Christianity, for the entirety of our doctrine and practice. From the smallest thing to the largest thing, it's under attack. And you might say, well, that's a small thing, Pastor, let it go. That's a small thing somebody has done, let it go. Ah, but these small things begin to roll and roll and roll and roll and eventually become a massive, massive earthquake for the church. So we can't just let it go. Every sin is sin and must be dealt with. Every disobedience is disobedience and must be dealt with. 
A husband who doesn't love his wife the way Christ loves the church is but a small thing that he doesn't do. And very soon, you're 10 years into your marriage and you find you've got a problem because you haven't realized that of, of, of obeying the Lord in loving your wife the way Christ loves the church. In the same way, when a woman doesn't understand that God created her to be a help me to her husband first before she is a nurse or a doctor or a pharmacist or a healthcare worker or a professional or a CEO of a company, that God has created her not for that. Her primary purpose is to be help me to her husband. And so when she doesn't understand that and doesn't get to remind herself of that, these ideologies creep in and very soon in marriages, five, six years old or 10 years old, there's problems in the marriage. And so these things become problems as they grow if we do not deal with them from the start. And so Jude says, I want you to contend for it. He doesn't say, I want you to discuss it. He doesn't say, I want you to have coffee over it. He doesn't say, I want you to just have a light conversation. The word there is contend, and in the Greek, it means warfare. It means close contact combat. It means confronting somebody and dealing with it. So this is warfare. Where? Within the church. So you thought you're going to be battling outside the church, and yes, you will be. But Jude says you're going to be contending within the church for that which is the faith, the entirety of the faith. And how quickly our faith is being ridden over, how quickly our faith is being flooded by ideologies. Even our children growing up within the church, they're embarrassed to stand with us when we say, um, uh, uh, you know, biblical marriage has been between one man and one woman for life. Oh, because their friends are telling them something completely different. Their friends are telling them completely different about gender and sexuality and how a man is to be and how a woman is to be and how we are to raise our families. And so we have to contend for the faith. We don't want to just, just be a bunch of elderly people in the church. We want to be a bunch of people who are both young and old. And so we must contend for the faith. We must fight for something that we're going to hand to our children. We fight for the legacy of the church and the, and the power of the gospel and the plan of God for the church. We fight for that. We contend for that. We hold on to it and not allow it to be quickly eroded away. Let's, so, so Jude says then, listen, so Jude says there's a fight within the church, a warfare within the church. And it's warfare with people who have come in unnoticed. That means the elders of the church have been blinded or the leaders of the church didn't notice what's happening. And it takes us back to what we preached this morning, where Paul says, listen, I'm, I'm involved in your life as a pastor. I'm involved in the families of the church. Why? Because he's looking out for their souls. And listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, if the pastor, you want a pastor who cares for your soul, but you don't want a pastor who's minding your business. Let me repeat that. You want a pastor who cares for your soul, but as soon as he starts to mind your business, he says, stop, don't mind my business. You see, how is a pastor supposed to care for your soul then? Because caring for your soul means getting into deep relationship with you. Caring for your soul means, you know, getting into the, 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 the problems that you face in your life. Caring for your soul means, you know, he comes to your hospital bedside. He comes around to your house. He comes around and prays with you about what you're going through and what you're facing and, and, and the sins that are confronting your life. So he has to get personal with you. And so he can pray with you and he can encourage you and he can counsel you and he can discipline you. So, so, so Jude is saying, listen, these men have come in unnoticed. Somehow they've deceived the elders of the church. Somehow they've deceived the church. And it's interesting here, Paul, uh, sorry, Jude tells us, and I, I have fallen for this uh, about a year or two ago, and I've re I'm reaping the, the consequence of this, of what, uh, this has happened to me. This text has happened to me. I fell into this trap. Look at verse 16. These are grumblers finding fault, not that part. Well, I've experienced a lot of grumblers in my life in the church. These are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lust. But the last part of the text in verse 16, they speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. I have men who have told me, oh, that was so great, that was so great. For, for, that, was a, that, that, that was a great sermon, that, that was really good, I love how you do that. Merely for the sake of gaining advantage. And I recognize that. And I've learned how to deal with people who say, that's a good sermon. I've learned how to deal with that. I've learned from that mistake. 
So these men come and gain advantage that way. So you can understand now how, they, how they've come in unnoticed. They're flattering the pastor. They're flattering the church. And they come in and people give them positions in the church. And very soon they find that they are now taking authority and teaching poor doctrine. Well, that was just the introduction. Let's exposit the text tonight. Beginning at verse 5. As a, as, as a continuation from verse 2, beginning at verse 5, Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after having, saved, after having saved a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. You're about to go into what one pastor, who I greatly respect, calls the three threes. The three groups of threes. The three groups of threes. The three groups of threes begin here from verse 5. Are you with me right now? Uh, the three groups of threes. We're going to see the three groups of threes here. Uh, this is not my, this is not my uh, uh, observation in the way I've worded it. It is my observation, but it's not my observation in the way I've worded it. I've borrowed it from one of my mentors in the way he's worded it. The three groups of threes. What are the three groups of threes? It begins here from verse 5. Concerning the first group is those who did not believe. The second group is, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain. And the third group is Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around it. The next group of threes begins in verse 8. Yet in the same way, these men, they also by dreaming, defile the flesh, number one, reject authority, number two, and revile angelic majesties. That's the second group of three. Three things there. The third group of three is from verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, number one. Uh, for, for pay they have rushed headlong into the era of Balaam, number two, and perished in the rebellion of Korah, number three. So you've got three groups of threes. Three groups of threes. If you if you've didn't catch that, I'll repeat it as I progress through the text. So the first one. The first time we see apostasy, and that's the word that we're looking at. The title of the sermon this evening is Danger Within the Church. And the danger within the church is apostasy. It is the group of people who do not deny the pastor or rebel against the pastor or denounce the pastor, but it's the group of people who reject God, who walk away from God, who abandon God. This is apostasy. And so the first apostasy we see um, Jude tells us in verse 5, he says, Now I desire to remind you, though you all know, though you all, let me just repeat that, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving people out of the land of Egypt, this is Yahweh, Jehovah, uh, that's what it is in the, in the, in the, in the, in the original reading, uh, the Lord, Jehovah, after saving people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. That's the first apostate generation. The apostate generation. What do they do? They made a golden calf. They worshiped the golden calf. They abandoned God after being delivered from Egypt. This is Israel. This is Israel he's talking about here. Within them is... Uh, is the apostate generation. They've abandoned God. And Jude is setting us up here to see the judgment that's upon them. Number two, there's a judgment for number two as well. Number two, it says, and angels who did not keep their, keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. What has he done for them? Well, how has he judged them? He has kept in, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So those angels who rebelled, those angels who did not recognize their proper place, they rebelled against God. God has a judgment for them. So in the same way, God judged the apostate generation who after coming out of Egypt, made the golden calf and did all that. What did God do? He judged them. What did he bring? Death upon them. In this way, he says, he, he goes on further to talk about judgment. He says the second of the the second, uh, uh, the second of the first group of threes. He says this, or the second point of the first group of threes. The first point was the ones who abandoned God, the apostate generation. The second one is the angels who didn't keep their proper domain. God has a judgment for them. And then the third group, or the third, or number three within the first group, 
Verse 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, the, 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 these men were so full, the, the, the city was so full of sexual immorality. And when you see Sodom and Gomorrah, you immediately think of heterosexual sin, sorry, homosexual sin. Not the case. It is homosexual sin and heterosexual sin. That means fornication, adultery, even within heterosexual relationships. But also homosexuality. In fact, not just the word that we know homosexuality today, but the word it, by which it was known, sodomy. Sodomy was the practice. The evil of sodomy. God judged them for that. To such a point where when the angels came down, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to have sexual relationship with them. Such was their abomination, such was their sin. But be careful, be clear. I'm telling you this because um, it's not just a judgment for homosexual sin. It's a judgment also for heterosexual sin. And so, Judy's building a case here. The first one was the apostate a, a, a generation. The second one was the angels who didn't keep their proper abode. The third one was Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. It says, since they in the same way as these, since they who? They, number one, the apostate generation. They, number two, the angels who didn't keep their proper domain. And they, number three, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Since they in the same way as these, who are the these? These men who have come in unnoticed in the church. Can you see what he's doing right now? He's saying that these men who come in and cause all this problem in the church, there's a great judgment upon them. In such a way, the same way the apostate generation was judged when they came out of Egypt, in the same way the angels will be judged who didn't keep their proper abode, in the same way Sodom and Gomorrah was judged. This is serious, right? So there's a they and a these there in the grammatical construct of the text. There's a they and a these. The they are the number one to number three that we just mentioned. And the these are the men that have come unnoticed into the church. But these indulge in gross immorality. And so you see, see, I, see I, I, I told you, it's, 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 it's homosexual sin and heterosexual sin because he says gross immorality. And that's why he brings in Solomon and Gomorrah, not just homosexuals, not just, uh, um, well, homosexual sin and heterosexual sin. They indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, even as Sodom and Gomorrah did, are exhibited as, a, as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So there's a judgment for them. These men who come into the church and do this, there's a judgment for them. And Jude is showing us by inspiration of the Spirit, what their judgment is going to be like. Sodom and Gomorrah was a fire that came down and destroyed the cities around them. But that fire ceased. It stopped. You go to where Sodom and Gomorrah is today, there is no fire there raging today. Why? The fire stopped. But Jude says there's a punishment of eternal fire upon these men. That means it's the judgment that will come upon all sinners in the worst possible way, where they'll be burning eternally in the lake of fire. And you know our teaching on that, right? You know what the Bible says about that. You and I will be resurrected in our new bodies. The coming of the Lord, when you die, when you leave this world, your body goes into the ground to be buried, and your soul goes to be with the Lord. And when you are raised from the dead, uh, when you, sorry, when Jesus comes back again, you will come, he will bring you with his uh, with, with your soul and he will unite you, he will raise your body but your body will not be the old body that you have right now because your body will be decomposed, it will be disintegrated, it may turn into dust, he'll give you a new body and the new body is so that it can live eternally, permanently, forever with the Lord that you can stand in the presence of God Right now, I had to wear my sunglasses coming out here this afternoon. Why? Because the sunlight was so powerful that I had to put some sunglasses on. Why? Because these earthly eyes cannot look at the sun. These earthly eyes cannot bear the bright light of the sun. Therefore, I need the protection of glasses in this sunlight. Now imagine this. In the book of Revelation says, you'll be standing before Jesus 
and he will wipe away every tear from your eye and there'll be no longer any more sun in the sky. Who will be the light? Jesus Christ. If these eyes cannot stand the created sun, how can they stand the creator? How's it going to work? He's going to give you new eyes. What kind of eyes? Supernatural eyes. He's going to give you a supernatural body that does not age, that does not burn, and you can stand in the presence of a holy God and not be consumed. Now, if God is doing that for you, to give you the believer, if you're a believer tonight, you're going to get a brand new body to stand in the presence of God. But ah, if you're an unbeliever like these people, you're also going to get a new body. God's not being unfair here. He's being just and right. They will also get a new body. Everybody will be resurrected. The worst of sinners will be resurrected. Adolf Hitler will be resurrected. Uh, rapists and murderers will be resurrected. But they'll be resurrected and given a new body, and the new body for what? For the lake of fire. So in the same way you stand in the presence of God and you will not be consumed, they will be burning eternally in the lake of fire. That's what their body will be for, burning eternally in the lake of fire. Because with these bodies, it will burn gone. With these bodies, it will burn because you put a body right now into a, um, what, what, what do they call these things in the, in the crematorium? Yeah, yeah, crematorium, right? Furnace, yeah. They put it in the furnace and the heat is so intense that it totally obliterates even the bones of your body. It comes out as dust. So if you're gonna burn eternally, eternally in the lake of fire, with these bodies, it's not going to last. God gives you a body that will last forever. God gives the sinner a body that will last forever in the lake of fire. If you're an unbeliever tonight, you don't know the Lord, why would you take a chance with your soul? Come to Christ, believe in the Lord, and be saved, that you may be resurrected into eternal life in the presence of God and not burn in the lake of fire forever. But this is the judgment upon these men. This is a judgment upon these men who have come in unnoticed. And now you go into the second group of threes. As if that wasn't enough to say, listen, this is how dangerous it is in the church. I have this judgment for these men. He goes on in verse 8 and says, yet in the same way, these men. He refers to them as these men. Now he refers to them as these men a number of times. You've just seen one. Uh, you've, you've just seen one in verse 7 where he says these men. In verse 8, it says, these men. Uh, in verse 14, it says, these men. Uh, in verse 12, it says, these men. It's constantly referring to them as these men. In verse 8, yet in the same way, these men, also by dreaming. So these men within the church who are influencing people are not influencing people by the Holy Word. They're influencing people by dreaming. What does Jude mean, Jude mean by that? It means that they're making up these philosophies and ideas in their mind. They're dreaming about these things about how to lead the church. They're coming up with these ideas that are not found in God's word. And so yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming, what do they do? They do three things. And here's the second group of three. Number one, they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they revile angelic majesties. Now what does it mean? They defile the flesh in the same way, you talk about sin and allowing uh, sin to affect us in the way it does affect us. They have no problem here with sin. They reject authority. And when, they say we, when he says they reject authority, it takes us back to verse four. What does verse four, the end of verse four says? Um, uh, the persons who turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny our master and Lord Jesus Christ. They're denying who Christ is. They're denying who our master and our Lord is. It's a rejection of um, the Lordship of Christ. So they reject the authority. They, have the, they, are the, they are themselves the authority. They reject authority. And then the last part is very interesting. The last part. The last part says, and they revile angelic majesties. What does it mean? They revile angelic majesties. Well, basically what this means, I'll sum it up for you very quickly. Basically, when the Lord brought the word to Moses on Sinai, it was brought in the presence of angels. Angels accompany his word. Angels are associated with God's word. And here when they say he is reviling angelic majesties, 
is in a sense saying that they have no regard for the, uh, the hosts of heaven. They have no regard for the angelic majesties that accompany God's word. So these are men who have absolutely no regard for the things of God. And he gives us three ways in which you do that. And then he brings in verse 9. And verse 9 is pretty interesting. Because he tells us, he compares us, he compares these men with an angelic majesty. He compares these men with the Michael the archangel. And listen to what he says. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, if you're going to try and find where that text is, let me help you. It's no way. You can't find it. <laughs> it's not in the Old Testament. You will not find that text in the Old Testament. It's nowhere to be found. This is the only place it's found. So Jude is telling us, by inspiration of the Spirit. Because what had happened? What had happened? Moses died. God instructs Michael the archangel to bury the body of Moses. That way nobody would find it. God in his infinite wisdom knew that if Moses was buried somewhere, people would make that an object of worship. People would go on pilgrimage there. And so he, he instructs Michael to, to bury the body of Joseph, uh, sorry, of, of Moses. And what does the text tell us? When he disputed with the devil, when Michael disputed with the devil, what is this dispute about? Well, the devil is trying to get Moses' body. For what purpose? Because the devil is the accuser of the brethren, correct? What, what the devil wants to do, when he says devil, he means Satan. Michael is contending here with Satan. Well, he, well, Jude doesn't say contending, he says disputed. I mean, he's arguing with Satan about the body of Moses. Why does Satan want the body of Moses? Because Satan wants to prove that Moses is a sinner and doesn't deserve the eternal presence of God. Why? Moses killed the laborer in Egypt, correct? And Moses struck the rock in disobedience to God. So he wants to accuse Moses before God. He wants to take the body of Moses before God and say, listen, if you're going to judge me, this man deserves judgment. Judge him. Because this is what he did, God. Listen, do you not remember? He killed the laborer there. He's a murderer. He struck the rock in rebellion against you. Look, is this your son? Is this your servant? He disobeyed you and he struck the rock. So Satan wants to accuse Moses. What does, what does Michael do? Michael's under orders from Yahweh from Jehovah from the one true God he must bury the body of Moses so he argues and disputes with Satan but listen to what the text tells us in this dispute there is no disrespect from Michael to Satan now watch very carefully listen very carefully the number of people I we were you know me from our Pentecostal church in the large Pentecostal church we had how people in the Pentecostal Charismatic Church would talk about the devil, Satan, and call him all sorts of names and speak disrespectfully about him. Correct? Correct? Listen to how Michael speaks about Satan. Listen to what Jude says about how Michael speaks to Satan. We know Satan is the enemy. We know he's the adversary. We know he's Apollon, he's Abaddon, he's the dragon, he's the snake. We know all that. So also does Michael. Michael also knows that. You're not privileged to information that Michael doesn't know. Michael knows all this. After all, this Satan was Lucifer who once sat with Michael. They served together in the, uh, in the, as angelic majesties in the holy realms with God. So Michael knows who Satan is. And though Satan is a fallen angel and deserves the judgment that God is going to bring to him, Yet Michael refuses to speak to Satan disrespectfully. It's in the text. It's in the text. What does he say? He says, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. If you're ever dealing, and I say this even as we prepare for Saturday, as we go out into the public square, I'm meeting with some of you tonight, you're going to encounter Satan manifesting himself right before you. Here's what I want you to say. From all of your conviction, you say, the Lord rebuke you. When they swear at you next Saturday, and they put all sorts of things in your face, and say the worst things about you, you say, the Lord rebuke you. 
You're not going to come up with any sort of thing that you, any flowery language against Satan that you want to come up with. You follow the example here of the text. You say, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. Now I can expand on that a lot further. And uh, I, I, I don't have time to do that tonight. We, we can expand on that a lot further. <clears throat> so, so listen to what he says in verse 9. Uh, this is Michael. He, 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 he did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you. He throws it back on God. He throws it back on God. The Lord rebuke you. Yahweh, Jehovah rebuke you. Why? Because he knows who he is dealing with. And why does, why, does, why does Jude bring this up? Because he's dealing with men who revile against angelic majesties. The word revile there in the Greek means blasphemy. They blaspheme against angelic majesties. And so he's bringing in Michael who says, Michael dare not revile. Michael dare not blaspheme. He will not speak disrespectfully to Satan. He recognizes his place in the authority under God. And then we get to the third group of threes. The third group of threes begins at verse 10. But these men, again, here's the words, these men, what do they do? They revile, they blaspheme the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. Woe to them. This is judgment. This is warning. Woe to them. This is harsh and stern. Woe to them. For they have gone the way of Cain, number one. This is the third group of threes. They've gone the way of Cain, number one. For pay, they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam. And number two, number three, sorry, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Three things there. Jude is making a strong case here. The book of Jude, one chapter, like Philemon, one chapter, short book. But yet it is so condensed. It is power packed. It's a theological gem. It's wonderful. It's glorious in this one chapter. What does he say here? He brings up three men. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. For these men have gone the way of Cain. What do you mean? What does he mean? He takes us back to Genesis 4. In Genesis 4, Cain kills Abel. Why? Because he's angry with his brother. Why is he angry with his brother? He's angry with his brother because his brother does right before God and brings the right offering before God. We're talking about this as a family over our lunch on Friday. And the question asked in our family table as we discussed this uh, particular text, we were saying, did, did, did Cain know what he needed to bring? Why did God judge him for bringing the wrong offering? Did Cain, did, did Cain not know that he needed to bring a blood offering, a blood sacrifice? Abel brought a blood sacrifice. Cain didn't. Cain was a tender of the ground. Abel was a tender of the flock. Abel brought from the flock. Cain brought from the ground. Is God being unreasonable? Why did God judge him? God's not being unreasonable. Although the text doesn't tell us we know for sure that God cannot judge Cain for what he hasn't already told Cain. So Cain already knows what he needs to bring. He already knows it has to be a blood offering. Although the text doesn't tell us. He already knows that. Because Abel knows that. And so we find that they've already been taught this. They already know this. But what does he do? He does not do that. He brings an offering that's unacceptable to God. And the, and the text tells us here in Jude, they've gone the way of Cain. Meaning, they've gone the way of Cain, meaning that Cain knew what to do, but he didn't do the right thing. That these men know what to do, but they haven't done the right thing. How many of us are so prone to going the way of Cain? You and I, you, I look at you today and I look at myself. We are prone to going the way of Cain. What do I mean? We know what is right to do, but we don't want to do it. How many times you know what's right to do? Argument in the family, argument between husband and wife, battling with the children, in the church, you know what's right to do, but you just don't want to do it. May the Lord help you as you pray and ask Him to forgive you of your sin. That we not be like these men who go the way of Cain.
Number there's the second one. And pay for they have rushed and for pay and for money for pay for financial gain, they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam. For pay, for money, for financial gain, they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, meaning what? In Numbers chapter 22 all the way to 25, you find this man called Balaam. Balaam is used by God. But Balaam decides that he is going to, uh, they've come and offered him money so that he could uh, uh, deter Israel, he could deter the people of God. He refuses, initially refuses. But then when we get to Numbers chapter 31, verse 16, it says that uh, uh, um, Balaam had so influenced the nation towards uh, prostitution, towards harlotry. And it started with his financial gain. It started with, him, with the money that he had received um, from the enemies of God. And so Jude tells us that uh, the, the, the error of Balaam was for financial gain. They rushed headlong into error. Application-wise, how many of you today, how many of us today rush headlong into error because of financial gain? We were talking today in our home. And one of my family members said, I heard the conversation. If he works X amount of hours during the weekend on a Sunday, he could make more money. And making more money, you add it up by the end of the year, comes to about 50,000 pounds. But he doesn't work on a Sunday. Doesn't work on a weekend. You see, it's easy to get caught up in this. For the sake of money, you go down a particular road. Error. Error. <laughs> obey the Lord. Obey the Sabbath. Come to church. Obey the Lord's day. Sit with the people of God. Pray with the people of God. Raise your children like that. Not for time in a third on a Sunday you want to work extra. Not for double overtime you want to work extra. Leave it. Leave it alone. There are other things that are more important than money. But here, for the sake of money, for the sake of financial gain, they ran headlong into error. And number three, the third in this group of threes, is, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Here again, perished in the rebellion of Korah, Korah and the people in Numbers chapter 16, uh, who raised their accusation against Moses. Their rebellion against Moses. All of these leaders came and said, Moses, listen, God is not only with you, God is with us. Why should we listen to you? Because God is with all of us. We don't need your leadership. So they rebelled against Moses. They rejected authority. And this is in keeping with, um, with verse 8 where it says they reject authority, not just the authority who is the authority, Jesus Christ, but the way the authority is manifested within the church. The eldership, the ones who lead the church, are the authority of God, the biblical authority of God. Hebrews chapter, uh, at the end of Hebrews, in the 13th chapter, it says that you are to obey the leaders in your church who watch over your soul, for that is profitable for you, that you, you listen to them, because they watch out for your soul. So Moses here is watching out for the soul of the people, but what do these men do? They rise, they get a group together, and they go to him and say, listen, we don't want to listen to you. You can't be our leader. God's with us, God's with you. Why should we listen to you? Because we are just the same as you. Because God is with us as he is with you. And they perished in the rebellion of Korah. God judged them for that. And I will end with this part as we come to an end now. I will end with this part in verse 12. It says, these are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feast. Having said all that in these three groups of threes, he says, these men, these are the men who are what? Who are hidden in your church. They're hiding in your church. They're hiding amongst you. How do you know they're hiding amongst you? He says, listen, it says, they, they, they are hidden reefs in your love feasts. When they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. The love feasts, if you remember from, the, from 1 Corinthians, um, where uh, before the Lord's Supper, before the Holy Communion, they would share food together. And Paul says, you've, you've dishonored the Lord's Supper because you've, you've taken the love feast into the Lord's Supper. In the way you eat food and talk, you're regarding the Lord's Supper that way. In the way you're being so casual in the way you eat, you're being so casual with the Lord's Supper. So there was a love feast of people would gather to eat. And Jude is saying, these men are sitting in your love feasts. They're sitting together with you. They're sitting next to you. And they're sitting next to you without fear. Caring for themselves. 
The next way he describes them, they're clouds without water. They're clouds without water. Carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit. They're not bearing anything that's keeping with who they are in that season. Doubly dead. Doubly dead. Uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up their own foam, or own shame like foam. Wandering stars from whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. There's a judgment for them. And here the picture is of black darkness. Paul, so Jude, and using his words here to describe the lost, the, the lost eternity that they will be in without the presence of God. I've given you quite a mouthful in the last half an hour. I'm going to stop right here. Next Sunday evening, we'll pick up from verse 14 and we'll finish the text, especially with the great doxology and the great benediction at the end from verse 24. We'll pick that up next Sunday evening. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for the opportunity we have tonight to once again open your word. Lord, I've been brief tonight. I do hope and pray that I've done justice to your text, Lord. If there's anything, Lord, that I've left out, please, Lord, remind me that I may, when I come back next week, cover it again. Much application has come from this tonight, Lord, we do pray that indeed that your people who are here tonight and those watching by way of YouTube will indeed, Lord, find not just comfort, Lord, but conviction in the text. Help us, Lord, as we pray about our safety within the church, that we keep ourselves and these things will not go unnoticed, that we be warned and be aware and discern everything around us. And Father God, this we ask and pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'll just give you a closing thought. Every one of you in your place of work has a, not health and safety, what do they call it? Safeguarding. You have a safeguarding policy. Every one of you has a safeguarding policy. Your work does so hard to give you the safeguarding policy. You actually have somebody who's a safeguarding manager to make sure everybody within that place is safe, that they do not do something that's not safe. Yet in the church, the Lord tells us how we can be safe. There's a safeguarding for the church, and we don't want to listen to it. May the Lord hear our prayers and keep us safe. Amen.